Hi, I'm Kendall Segan here with the Transforming Autism Project to discuss today challenging behaviors, why does it happen, and what can you do as a parent to help it? So starting off, the objectives for today's session is learning a greater understanding of your child's behavior and also simple strategies that you can use to help support your child specifically. Our wonderful CEO said that there was colossal power in how we reacted to things, not only in our behavior, but also in our unspoken thoughts and attitudes. And that leads us right into what this behavior is that we see and we define it as challenging. Any behavior that we see is communication. So it's important to remember that throughout this whole presentation and moving forward, that when you see something happening, it's your child trying to communicate with you. Remember that the most challenging behavior is always going to be your child's best attempt to communicate something important. So when we think about understanding behavior, this behavior always has a meaning. There's a reason why your child is doing what they are doing. If we take a step back and we think of a real life example, we can think if you or I were to be driving in a car listening to one of our favorite songs. Suddenly, if traffic comes up, we then are in a standstill. Let's say there's a big accident ahead of us. There are semis next to us. There's blaring car horns. There's a hot sun gleaming on us. At that moment, our anxiety gets compounded and all of these senses together raises our anxiety. We want to get out of this traffic jam, but there's nowhere to go. So a typical response that you or I would feel would be agitation or frustration. The next thing that could happen on top of our anxiety is we could turn off the music, we could close our eyes, we could take deep breaths, or we could engage in the road rage outbursts. It's important to know that the, it, the option that you or I engage in is our response to these overwhelming stimuli. Whereas if you think about it with our children, they could be in a situation with overwhelming stimuli that we might not be aware of and they're experiencing the same anxiety, agitation, frustration that we are experiencing in that car scenario. So it's important to remember and try and correspond that when we have these feelings, thinking about how it relates to when our child has these feelings to get a better understanding of what's happening. Ultimately, behavior communicates one of these five things. I don't like this, I'm scared, I'm confused, I'm tired, I don't want to do that, this is too much for me, or I need something. Working on why do we need to understand behavior, there's multiple reasons behind why understanding this is so important for your child with autism. Most importantly, your child is wanting to gain independence. They're wanting to do the right skills and to be independent on their own, but right at this moment, they might not have the toolkit ready for that. They also want to develop the language skills, but might not have the communication ability to communicate effectively their wants and needs when they are feeling frustrated. They also have a different neurological processing than a normal child, which might make it harder for them to regulate the anxiety and the frustration that they're feeling. And ultimately, this anxiety, this lack of control, it can be too much to manage for them. So given some of these social learning difficulties, we need to understand that these behaviors that we see in children with autism, depending on the age, are things that we wouldn't see in a neurotypical child because it might take a child with autism longer than someone else to learn how to communicate effectively, to learn how to cope with their stressful environments. And also, in these, given their social learning difficulties that some may have, children with autism might struggle to learn as fast as someone who's neurotypical. They might struggle to communicate their wants and their feelings in stressful situations. So with all of this in mind, it is important to remember this when learning what can we do to help my child? And if in an ideal situation, if your child wanted to communicate, if it was easy for them to communicate it effectively, they would do it. This challenging behavior that you see 
isn't something that's occurring just because they like to do it. It's something that it's the way that they self-soothe themselves. It's the way that they learn to communicate whatever it is they're trying to get across. If they could do it more effectively, it would, it would make life much easier for everyone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the way they're communicating it is wrong. So some of the simple strategies that I have for parents is help your child learn and label their emotions. It's really simple when you're going through a situation or when you see your child struggling with something, help them, take them out of the situation and mirror it for them. Oh, you're really feeling frustrated right now. I can see that you really wanted that toy. Helping them recognize it, sharing it, and learning how to label it is very important. Do this often with them. It's really good if they can start to learn, what is this emotion that I'm feeling? So then maybe later in the future, they can learn how to cope with it more appropriately. Also, it's important to try and recognize those early signs of their frustration. As a parent, you know the child best. So if you see something in their body language or something in the environment that you think is gonna trigger it, remember to respond appropriately, supportively, and calmly. It's always important as a parent to respond calmly. This also helps your child. It shows your child that you are responding calmly and then shows them that an adult is responding calmly. It helps mirror and kind of role play the image of what you want them to do. Always remain calm, take a deep breath. It can be frustrating and it can be anxiety provoking. It can be overwhelming for you as a parent to see your child going through these challenging behaviors, but remember that you're with them through the entire process. You keep them in a safe space. You keep it where you are in control of the situation. And remember that if you can manage your own anxiety during these situations, it's going to better help how you help your child in these situations. And also, I always like to mention that when your child is going through challenging behaviors, it's important that as a parent, you don't try and interact too aggressively or too fully with your child, because this is a time when your child is probably feeling severely overwhelmed. If you think of it in the real life car example that we spoke about in the beginning, if you're stuck in that traffic jam and your partner is trying to call you asking, when are you getting home for dinner? That would probably send you over the edge. And it's just thinking that when you're in that car situation, all you want is to be alone and to handle it and to get through it. And remembering that with your child, you want them to handle it and to handle it, they need your help and your assistance, doing it in a calm and safe environment. The way that you think, feel, and behave in your home environment is something that's going to project how your child feels. So make your home a safe environment, have them feel protected, and most importantly, let them feel understood. So if they are going through these challenging behaviors, understanding and showing them that you understand, oh, I understand you're feeling really frustrated, you didn't get the toy today, letting them know that you not only label their emotion, but also understand their emotion is really good for your connection with your child. Some basic coping skills I like to use is if you have a child who's, exp um, who's experiencing these challenging behaviors, you can use some of these examples. For instance, if they, and it really all depends on the situation, but if you see that they're feeling stressed, one of the really, my top favorites is having them learn to clench their, their fists together. So when they get really, really mad, they learn to do this, rather instead of maybe grab someone else or grab you. They learn to do it themselves to calm themselves down. Also learning to say no thanks, um, learning that they can take a break when needed. Remember that their challenging behavior is to communicate something. And that something is what we need to figure out. And to figure out what that something is, we need to make them feel safe and make them feel understood. And to do that, we can provide them with these coping skills and let them know that the next time you feel this way, you can either ask me for a break. You can tell me, no, I don't wanna do that. You can ask me for help. 
and give them these different coping skills of what they can do instead of exhibiting their challenging behavior. Always important to remember, like in that car situation, in that scenario, when our frustration and anxiety increases, our communication decreases. And this is the exact same for the children. When a child is feeling frustration and anxiety, they might not have the tolerance that we as an adult has. And we need to know that, that when we feel frustrated and anxious, sometimes our coping strategy is to pull away, is to draw back. And that's us decreasing our communication because of how we feel. It's the exact same thing with our children. When they're feeling frustrated and anxious, they can also exhibit more challenging behaviors because their communication is decreasing. So it's important to know that when you see these challenging behaviors, there is frustration, anxiety, and some feeling and communication behind it. So it's really about shifting the way we think about it, shifting the way we understand this. Instead of thinking that our child is intentionally doing something bad, oh, our child intentionally acting out, we need to see it as our child doesn't understand what's happening. Our child is overwhelmed, is feeling stressed, is out of control. They are trying to communicate something to us. And with that shift in understanding also comes the idea that when they exhibit these challenging or inappropriate behaviors, they are going to show these coping behaviors. So we have to recognize that when we see challenging behaviors, it is in fact coping mechanisms that your child has. So with knowing all of that, with understanding behavior, I wanted to open up the floor to the parents that are in this webinar asking what are some of your child's challenging behaviors that brought you to join this webinar. I would love to hear them and I would love to help you with them. Hi, Kendall. Hi, let me stop sharing my screen one second so you can just see me. Oh, there you are. Hold on. I can still see me, so hold on. Can you see me okay? I can, yeah. Okay, great. Great. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think there's just one other. Am I right in thinking? Mark, there's someone Martra also. I'm not sure if they're just listening in or whether or not they're joining in. Um, I, I, I guess from my point of view, some of the things I'm facing the greatest challenges with right now. So I have uh, an autistic, a six-year-old autistic boy um, who is in mainstream school with one-to-one -one support. Okay. On his own is absolutely a delight, but the sibling relationship is really complicated, and okay. it's really the sibling part that I'm finding the greatest challenge because. It seems that when interacting with his three-year-old brother, so of course he's the eldest, mm -hmm. um, this is where we're seeing an awful lot of um, challenging behavior. Uh, okay. A lot of, um, uh, the, the, the three-year-old doesn't really understand why perhaps um, the six-year-old is behaving in the way that he's behaving. And it can okay. be anything from overly dominating the games, overly dominating the situations, snatching toys from the three-year-old and taking okay. them out of the, the, the environment that they want them to be in and the three-year-old responds by screaming um okay. you know literally he's learned a still a skill and a technique that you could shatter glass with um okay. and he deploys this technique wherever he sees fit okay and of course when he starts to scream my eldest child then loves some you know because he 
whilst he does understand about being able to try and, and obviously through various speech and language therapy, understands the concept of where he's too high when his emotions are right or not, mm -hmm. he doesn't always like to use it. Okay. And he chooses, you know, he, he enjoys the feeling of, you know, the excitement of when the other child is screaming. And this can happen in a cafe. This can happen on the, in the car on the way to school. This can happen, you know, pretty much kind of anywhere. And very, very quickly out of nowhere, the, the circumstances escalate out of all control. Okay. And you find yourself feeling quite helpless as a parent in a situation where both children are suddenly behaving in a way that is pretty awful. Right. I, I can imagine that. And it's probably stressful for you. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. <laughs> to say the least. Um, so what exactly is your question in that scenario? Um, I, I think it's um, understanding the, 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 the obviously the, the, the points that you've made, is, 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 which are great, and it's always good to kind of remind oneself, but it's how to apply those into circumstances where clearly, uh, as an autistic child, he still has to interact with the rest of the world. He's still got to go to school. He still has a brother. He still uh, inevitably gets invited to little children's parties, etc. And right. it's trying to, and obviously those situations can be quite overwhelming, and we can see those coming. Right. But it's trying to kind of build the relationship, I guess, so that he, um, uh, you know, that I don't know. It's it's it's. I'm, I guess I'm struggling to the, 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 with a direct question because what I'm what I'm trying to nail, and it's not quite so easy, is you know how to improve, if you like, the relationship between you. I mean, they get on with each other, they love each other. But they, the, the, it's almost instantaneously the moment they're in a room together, they're the, the sort of all what the, we've learned, all the calmness, all the all the sort of good behaviour skills that we've done, just seems to disintegrate incredibly quickly. And I don't know how to build that back together again so that I can, I can sort of get them onto a calm level. Obviously, the three-year-old has, you know, a limit the understanding of a three-year-old. You know, Absolutely. he doesn't understand why his elder brother won't play a game with him or steals his toy or you know right. does all those things and i don't know how to manage that okay yeah really really good question and really good overall scenario because a lot of the times you can label all of these strategies you can label all of these techniques but then once you actually get into a real life situation and you think okay my six-year-old knows how to do this they've learned these managing how to manage their difficulties they've learned how to have appropriate behavior but then something else happens and so it's really really good that you asked this question I think if you have the time when your children are playing is it is it realistic for you to be playing with them and to be kind of in between them when they are playing or is that something that's not realistic in the environment that you're in no, I think it's perfectly realistic. Um, and I think that, you know, where we've learned over time is that you need to be in their environments. It's very difficult not to be. Obviously, what we're trying to do is to um, extract ourselves where we see good behavior happening. We want to step back um, and sort of step in when bad behavior happens. Um, yeah. it's, 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 you know, it, it seems that you, you know, you win one day and then it all seems to go to pot the next. So uh, right. uh, consistency is definitely an issue. Right, absolutely. And I think on top of everything, it's important to know that consistency, although it might be this ideal goal that you have, consistency might need to be broken up and do a little bit more of baby steps. So if you have your two children engaging in something and you see them engaging appropriately, it might be something for you to maybe stay with them while they're engaging appropriately. So it shows them and you can even discuss the dialogue with them, with the three-year-old, with the six-year-old together. Oh, look, you guys are playing so great together. You guys love each other. You guys are great brothers. Um, what a great relationship you guys have. Really saying you guys are happy when you play together and really enforcing when they are together. And then when they do have that difficult behavior as a parent deciding, am I going to address the three-year-old or am I going to address the six-year-old because wanting I'm sure in an ideal situation you want to say okay both children calm down but really realistically I think you need to pick your battle and decide who is going to be easier for you to calm down and bring into the normal environment 
if that's the six-year-old go for the six-year-old if that's the three-year-old go in that direction so if there's something you know because you know your children best so if there's something you know and you said it in the example that really aggravates one child or the other maybe seeing how you can um, eliminate that response or eliminate that behavior before it happens and then decide okay if this tantrum occurs am I going to address my three-year-old or my six-year-old first that way you don't have both of them going into an uproar that could at least be a starting point thank you for that can I just quickly just follow up on that because I'll just drill down slightly into that uh, that scenario a little bit we just for, with an example mm -hmm. um, I, and I guess coming a little bit closer to what you're saying um, the, uh, the the knock-on issues are um, how do you effectively um, discipline, if you like, uh, a, a, you know, a, a child in that environment? What's the right thing to do? Because what we're finding is is that obviously we are um, the discipline that we would apply to our eldest child with autism is different to the three-year-olds. But the three-year-old, of course, is now mirroring the responses of the autistic child because he's Absolutely. seeing that he's getting away with an awful lot more and my example for this very simply was you know uh two days ago um we got out of the car um the little one decided that they were going to race to the front door um and shouted ready silly go and ran and my autistic child wasn't quick enough to kind of catch up and the little one made it to the door first and proceeded proceeded to say i won i won i won and my autistic child just had a complete meltdown and started to kick me and hit me and okay. physically you know uh, whatever which is which is fine but of course the problem is in the view of the little one i'm never okay. quite sure what is the appropriate way to handle the autistic child because oh. i'm finding that the, the the relationship is getting worse and pri primarily because the little one is learning very bad behavior because he okay. can know, he should know better so I don't know, is it appropriate at that point to kind of, you know, to, to um, be cross with the autistic child, to say you're going to go to your bedroom. You know, he doesn't really understand. He's, you know, there he is having his meltdown. That's his emotions coming out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's kicking and hit, hitting, which is not what you want, but you can manage that. But is then what, the, you know, sort of demonstrating what is the appropriate line, if you like, to have. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yes, it does. And I think um, I can try and give as as a specific ex as well, a specific answer as possible. Yeah, but I know that difficult. Yeah, but ultimately, um, just as a sidebar, this is discipline is all depending on the parents. So yeah. based on whatever you feel comfortable with doing. But I think in that scenario, I don't think discipline necessarily is bad, depending on what the discipline is. Because if your child is six years old and he's having these meltdowns, it could be something like having um, uh, a schedule or having a visual, something that shows him when you have this meltdown, then you go to your room or then you do something or when you have this meltdown, you can ask for help or you can um, tell me you're feeling upset before the meltdown occurs. And then hopefully with trying to teach your six year old these responses, if that's the response he needs, then you can then show the three-year-old that this is also how he reacts and that this is how you can respond to it. But it's really tricky because children really learn by imitating. They love visuals. They love mimicking behavior. And so I can absolutely understand that when one child does a meltdown, kicking or throwing, the other child might think, okay, well, now I can do that. Now I can do that to dad and we'll see what happens. And so it's important just to to really decide with you and your partner, what is your main concern? And if your main concern is the six-year-old's meltdowns, if your main concern is the way the three-year-old reacts to the six-year-old, then you respond appropriately. So I guess it's really deciding, again, just to pick your battle and deciding, are we gonna focus on, okay, the three-year-old is now mimicking what's happening. Am I gonna discipline him or is it focusing on learning the six-year-old to have better engagement and deciding to go from there. Okay, yeah, thank you. I hope that helps. No, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I wonder I if there's anyone else out there. Well, I think there is, but I also wanted to mention for you, it could be something also for role play. If you ever have a chance to um, role play scenarios with both of your children, you can just be 
for instance, doing that race game where ready, steady, go, and you're running to the door, and you can do scenarios where you win as the dad, scenarios where you lose as the dad, and show how you respond in that situation, so you can lose and be like, oh, bummer, I lost today, but I'll try again tomorrow. And maybe then your three-year-old or your six-year-old might start to see that and be like, oh, okay, so it's okay if I don't win sometimes. And yeah. so it's, it's really good when they're in a good mood and when they're in a calm mood in the safe environment to just try and role play these scenarios because like you said, they can happen out of the blue and they can happen with anything. And so it's when you recognize it happening, taking note of it and then saying, okay, maybe later in this week we'll practice this and yeah. using it as future. Thank you. The, no, I think that would be really, really helpful actually. That's very good advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I see that Martha and Natasha are in here as well. Do you guys have any questions? Hi there. Hi, Kendall. Is Natasha? Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can. So um, I'm just listening to um, that situation that the, the guy was speaking about. I don't know his name because I joined a bit later. And, um, you know, I have a family of four children and my oldest in um, six is on the autism spectrum and um, a lot of these situations often occur but normally what I do is I, I separate her and I let her calm down in her bedroom um, for a little while and then I, I let her come out um, after you know sometimes 45 minutes even an hour um, and then she's totally calm and she's able to reflect on her behaviors a bit um, and then you know she it's almost like it didn't happen <laughs> so so I, th I think definitely that time out period and the calming down period is really really important um for a child um you know on the autism spectrum um and i i i understand um the issues of that the other children following and mimicking behaviors because you know i have four children and my oldest is autistic so it means that the other three you know think this is normal behavior so you know we do a lot of separating our daughter um from the others um i know my husband wants to try to integrate her more um but oftentimes you know we tend to separate like my husband would take you know the second two and i have a nanny for the my my youngest who's 15 months and then i would do one-on-one -on -one stuff with her and actually it works much better and i enjoy the time and she enjoys the time um and we have less of this um the problems of children mimicking certain behaviors when she has tantrums and meltdowns yeah that's, I mean, that's yeah that's all really really good and i think you're on the right track because the idea of separating i know integration ultimately will be the goal there but the idea of separating her not so much as like a timeout, but like you said as a calm down mm -hmm. and so she can take the time that she needs knowing that she does have different needs than your other children and she might need to be in her room by herself so that she can learn how to calm down and do that appropriately and effectively. I think that's really, really great. And mm -hmm. you mentioned also a really good point that it could be 45 minutes to an hour. And that's also something that a lot of parents would start to maybe escalate, freak out about if they're like, oh my gosh, my child's been taking so long to calm down but it's realizing mm. that the child will take as much time as they need. But I think putting them in that safe environment that you're doing is really, really great. And then yeah. ultimately being able to integrate her back because then you can teach her, if she's in her room, you can teach her then the coping strategies of, okay, you're calming down right now. Maybe she's taking breaths. Maybe she just needs a moment to breathe, but then mm. maybe eventually you can change it to, in the living room you have a calm down corner or you have like a calm down chair and something where she can go where she's still a part of the family but she's mm -hmm. separated in a way where she can take her own time without being bothered and so i think that could be a good way to integrate her eventually yeah that's a good idea yeah i could do that yeah um the other question i have is really again around behaviors and um, managing um 
you know, just the structure of the family. Um, it's very difficult when you have more than one child to constantly um, be behind one child who's meant to be the oldest and setting an example. Um, you know, I find that with my daughter, I'm having to um, be behind her a lot, remind her throughout the day of things that she needs to be doing, just general routine stuff. Um, and I, again, I thought about these visual aids and I've, I've created mm -hmm. visual aids in the household, but you know, she she's very stubborn and she doesn't want to even follow the visual aids, <laughs> literally. Um, so okay. she prefers we're just behind her and helping her all the time as opposed to her stepping up and using the visual aids. You know, we've tried to incentivize her with, um, you know, stars and collecting stars means mm -hmm. you get, you know, you get a present or a special treat um, that only lasted um, probably about three weeks and then she wasn't interested anymore. Um, okay. We've tried to incentivize her with earning money, like we give you 10p or 20p if you do this or that. And that incentivized her for a month um, and now okay. she's not interested anymore. So it's constantly trying to think about how to incentivize her to, you know, to, to kind of do as she's told, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And she, this is the one. Me? <laughs> this is the one who's six this is the one who's six yes okay um well first off it sounds like she likes to be with you is that correct yes she does yes okay um from hearing from hearing that example it sounds like the biggest incentive is you it yeah. sounds like she loves being with you and i think you can i mean rewards are up to parents and you can use any reward in the world but ultimately I think she's trying to communicate that she likes to be with you. And I mean, I could absolutely be wrong, but from hearing that example, it sounds like when you're behind her, guiding her through the day, I mean, why, why would she want a visual schedule if the visual schedule doesn't have mom? No. It's, it's no. very different. Yeah, but the, the, the point I'm making is that it's difficult when you have more than one child. If, you, if I had an only child, I'd be able to be behind her 24 right. seven but I have four children. So I, I, I'm always conscious that I, I don't want to spend 70% of, of my time with my, you know, child, my six-year-old who's on the autism spectrum. And I understand that she needs a bit more help, mm -hmm. but the others, um, it's not fair on the others. Right. And I can definitely understand that. And I think for that, you can then start to, depending on how your six-year-old reacts, you can start to um, implement the incentives that you're doing, implement the visual schedules mm -hmm. that you're doing, but also implement you with them. So when you're with her, maybe for 50% of the time behind her back, 50% of the time she has the incentives and the visuals. And then as that becomes successful, you then um, uh, elongate the gap a little bit more. 60% mm -hmm. schedules and visuals, 40% mom, and then make it bigger if she responds to that. 70% uh, visuals and schedules, 30% mom, because ultimately she needs your guidance and she's telling you something by wanting to be with you. And so I think using that to your advantage and getting her to respond the way you want her to, so then in turn, you have more time for the children, the other children. Yeah. Okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> Haven't thought about that one. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and it's it is challenging because like you said, you have four other you have three other children. You have four total. And if the six is the oldest, that's that's a pretty hectic household as a mom. Yeah, and she's turned seven soon. So she's turned seven in uh, two months time. Yeah. Um, so but she's still very much um, socially behind in her mm -hmm. you know, behaviors and understanding her emotions. Um, just social interactions is much is a lot more behind than my five year old or my my four year old. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I also find that if you like when your siblings interact together, you can also use that time of okay, my six year old can have mom, and mom's gonna be here, but also my five year old's gonna be with us, and we're gonna work on their social interactions together. And you can kind of do two birds with one stone in that situation. Yeah. No, I, I can I can do that, but I do often find that the, the three children who are the closest, so it's six, five, and four, mm -hmm. um, they are unable to play together, all three. And especially oh, okay. if my oldest is involved. The, the, the younger two can play together nicely and okay. 
really happy to play together. But as soon as my, you know, oldest um, gets involved, the dynamics totally change. And there's always a tantrum. There's always a fight. There's always something, basically. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's almost like the three cannot play together. Well, and I think, I mean, if you, if you take a step back from this situation, I've been a preschool teacher for many years. I, I would say that's pretty normal. Um, I, I would say that I have, I mean, a group of nine kids in one class and it's rare that I can get four of them playing together on the same activity. Mm. So, um, I can definitely understand the difficulty in that, but I also just want you to know that it's not, um, it's not something abnormal or anything to be too worried about. Um, maybe it could be something learning how to separate them. So you have maybe two activities going at the same time if you know that one activity for four is a lot or one activity for three is a lot or you could even have a table set up where they're all doing different activities but they're together and as long as they're still maybe one's coloring maybe one's doing puzzles maybe one's building legos but they're still together and maybe they're engaging with each other as they're playing or sharing look what i just built look what i'm coloring um, but they don't necessarily have to do the same activity together yeah. Okay, no, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you then, Kendall. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, hi, it's hi. Marta here. Can you hi. hear me? Yes. Ah, hello. Hi. So, um, well, thank you for for all the, that that presentation, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll try and uh, I'll try and put my question to you. I think it's uh, yeah. Um, uh, I hope I can formulate formulate it right. So, no problem. Um, I've um, I've got a uh, he's five year old son. Uh, he's on the spectrum, and then we also have a two two and a half year old um, girl. I can't can't possibly imagine how high I would handle if I had four like Natasha. But yeah, so we have two, and uh, one of the things that we um, struggle with the most is uh, with uh, my son's behavior around food so it's really it's really tricky actually because um he you know he, he really likes his food he, uh, I, I should say as well that he's uh, he's verbal but he has very lim limited language so he's able to say i want more banana please or uh, you know express his needs with maybe some kind of scripted uh, sentences like that but largely then otherwise he's um single word language and, and not huge vocabulary either so my two-year-old speaks more so he has he has some challenges there in, in that area to, to communicate but what happens around food and and what really puzzles us and, and everyone every of the you know every one of the specialists that we that we have talked with is that although he really really enjoys food and he likes anything to eat he's not a picky eater at all um you know, he gets really stressed before starting to eat. Um, this, so for instance, at breakfast, he always he has always the same breakfast, so there's no element of surprise there. So he has um, some bread with uh, peanut butter and banana, and then he has some porridge. However, you know, very often, if not every day, um, when he gets up, uh, I I get him up and I uh, still on pull up, so I change him into pants, and then he might be on a good uh, on a good mood. But as soon as we get to the breakfast room, to the to the dining room, he starts screaming, throws himself on the floor, um, says no, I don't want breakfast, and I say okay, if you don't want breakfast you can have breakfast later and then he says yes i do want breakfast and then he comes he goes running up and down the corridor and you know it takes us every time uh, this can happen at lunch it can happen at, at dinner and very often and you know it takes us a while to calm him down uh, sometimes it's about distracting him a bit sometimes sometimes it's about you know being very firm and saying eddie if you want to eat you have to eat now and you have to come to i'm going to count to five and you're going to calm down and then you know once he starts eating it's fine he kind of comes down and you know it's all good but i don't know how to break this that perhaps has become a habit of, uh, of making a scene before before a meal and i should also add that actually he eats at school five days a week and he doesn't make any of this you know uh, um, uh, any any of this uh, he he doesn't have any, this behavior of, at home he just sorry at school he just sits and eats his lunch very happily so I, I don't I, yeah I don't know if you have any idea anything you've come across before any tips that 
that you yeah. could share that would be really helpful for me. Thank absolutely you. absolutely i definitely have seen behaviors where parents will see them and then they'll talk to the teacher and they'll be like have you been seeing this and then the teacher's like no i've never seen yeah, that <laughs> yes yeah um they so just i definitely for yeah. us <laughs> right yeah. right um but so it's something to think about is why why is he keeping it from you uh or why is he keeping it for you and i think it's something to really to think about what is he communicating to you if you take all the details back what is he communicating to you when you wake him up and you say okay it's breakfast time and you walk him downstairs and he throws a tantrum what can you think of that maybe he's trying to communicate to you yeah we've we've thought about this i mean um sometimes i think that the the fact that uh, some days uh, her uh, sorry, his sister is awake and is going to have breakfast. Um, you know, he might feel very jealous because dad is having breakfast with her and he wants to just have full attention. We've, we've thought about like several things. I've thought about, is it, is it the smell of food that is suddenly overpowering? But, um, you know, then that would show also at school. So um, is it perhaps that it's a lot of pressure and it's like, you know, he has to, he has to um, kind of, he feels the pressure of having to sit at the table and finish his food. I, I don't know. I've I've tried and I can't, you know, I can't really put my finger on, on what might be he trying mm -hmm. to communicate other than perhaps um, in many occasions it's just about attention. I, I don't know. But if he was trying to communicate attention, what do you think he would be saying um, if he wasn't screaming and falling on the floor? What do you think he would be saying to you if he was trying to communicate attention? Um, I think um, he, like similarly to, to uh, what other parents have said before, I mean, he, he really enjoys being with us, especially one-on-one. -on -one. It is always a lot easier when he has full attention from an adult. He he thrives on that. Um, so, you know, what I thought is that perhaps he's, he's trying to say that, okay, I want to spend, I want dad to be with me alone or I want, um, I want some more time with mom. I, I don't, uh, okay. I don't really understand understand it, so I'm just you know throwing some ideas, but but okay. I'm not really sure I, I'm on the right track at all. Well, yeah, and I mean, and ultimately, um, I think you know it best. But mm. one other one other question for you is: when he has breakfast at home, who is at the table with him? It'll be uh, it'll be his dad and, and my husband and, and uh, yeah, and his sister. And are you at the table? Generally not. Generally, I don't have time for breakfast while I'm preparing. Okay. Them. Yeah, I'm preparing all the things to take to school. Yeah. So when he does get eating, what's happening? Well, it's basically if if we get to the point where he's happy to start eating, then he uh, nothing happens. He's just starting to eat. Then suddenly, <laughs> the whole uh, the whole house is a lot quieter. And um, yeah, we we try to at that time start kind of doing quite positive reinforcement and, and praise him on, on eating well and praise his sister as well and, and how well they're eating and being calm, etc. But that doesn't seem to last until the next meal. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. One thing, one thing I've learned about reinforcement mm. is that you basically have to give it all the time um, because if you nice. don't give it all the time, it won't then generalize into something else. Mm -hmm. But I also think that I wonder if maybe having um, a schedule for him, it sounds like he. It sounds like he's five. He sounds like he's independent, and he, it sounds like he wants to be more independent um, from the oh, situation okay. you explain. And so I wonder if maybe if you have a schedule for him, where after he wakes up, he can then decide, um, uh, I'm ready to eat now, or he can decide when he eats in the morning routine. And maybe if he feels more in control and more in charge of when he eats breakfast, maybe mm -hmm. that will help eliminate some of the behaviors. Right. Uh, that's a good idea. I think, you know, we have a schedule, a visual schedule, and, and he knows what's coming. But I think it's an interesting point about um, being more independent and, and, and not feeling in control. I, I, I thought about that before, that it per it's perhaps, you know, a control issue that he feels that something is being imposed on him. Um, right. So I thought I thought about so for per, perhaps at um, you know sometimes at, at uh, in the weekends they are doing something and then we give a warning we try to give several warnings like five minutes to lunch then three minutes mm -hmm. then two, but then you know he's uh, 
he's still sometimes not ready. And then that's where I thought, perhaps I just let him come to the table. I, we all go to the table and when he's ready, he comes and then he feels like, okay, I'm choosing. So perhaps yeah. I try that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it could be yeah. something of choosing, choosing two things. So you can choose to um, sit on the couch or you can choose to come to breakfast. You can choose mm -hmm. to come to the lunch table or read a book, something mm -hmm. where he gets to make the choice. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think with the positive reinforcement that you're giving him, when he does mm -hmm. get to the table and then showing him like, um, I'm glad you're sitting with us. Like, this is really nice mm -hmm. to have you at the table. Um, mm -hmm. And then letting him know that next time, if you want to come to the table sooner, all you have to do is say, um, I want to eat or mm -hmm. I want mom or I want dad at table. Something mm -hmm. where then you teach him what he could say so that maybe there's not that waiting period in between when he comes to the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. And we do have we do have a webinar coming up um, later in the months about food. And I would love if you joined back again and maybe we could check back in to see how everything is going and maybe see how we can talk yes. further about it. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. keep an eye out for that okay. one. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Uh, Kendall, I have a question. Yes. Um, it's Miss Hassi again. Sorry, hi. I, hi. I have a question because, um, you know, the teacher at um, my daughter's school um, is finding that my daughter um, challenges everything that has to be done, you see, and she's finding it particularly difficult to manage this in the classroom environment of 24 girls. Um, and you know, of course, she suggested um, a learning support uh, person, but more to manage behaviours, um, because she can't understand why my daughter, um, for example, if they have to write a story, um, is unable to, to just do the structure of the story like everyone else is doing and she wants to do it her way um, so I mean I don't know how to manage that personally and you know oftentimes you know I have to be very strict and leave the leave the room if you're not basically doing the homework as it should be done and let her calm down and then I come back in and I say are you ready to to work on it together and do it as the school asks us to do it and then if she's not then I leave it and then I just put in a diary that she just refused to do her homework <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, and I think I think you're on the right track, but I also think it sounds like your daughter might need a, a few more breaks. It sounds mm -hmm. like it might be a lot for her to handle altogether. And I know a classroom setting is a lot for a child, especially a child on the spectrum. Yeah. And I think if it's at all possible for the teacher to somehow give your daughter breaks within the structured exercises, I think that might help eliminate some of the challenging behavior. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the times when there is a classroom, you say there's 26, that's a lot of people to manage. Yeah. Um, if it is possible to have a shadow, I find that having a shadow in the classroom is really beneficial for children on the spectrum, mm -hmm. especially if they are exhibiting this challenging behavior, because then the shadow is there to ensure that the behavior is attended to and understood and um, taken care of essentially. And so then that shadow can then say, okay, um, what's going on right now? Um, what are you feeling? Is there something you don't want to do? And they can probably explore the situation more than the current teacher has time for. But mm -hmm. also it could be something if your daughter is at the intellectual level to say, hey, sweetie, what what's going on when you're going to sit down to do the writing assignment? What what do you what do you not like about it? Is there something you wish was different? And just try and explore more of what she wants to see if maybe she's trying to communicate. Maybe she doesn't like writing. Maybe there's something about the assignment she that she doesn't like. A lot, though. She just wants to do it her way. And you know, as you went, with, they're doing a lot of story writing now. And the story writing, there's always a structure. You know, um, introducing characters and then the the main body, and then you've got the plot and she doesn't want it she wants to do it her own way basically and not right. follow the culture. That's right yeah and I think this is also a great opportunity for you to role play with her maybe show um, your partner giving you a, an assignment um, of something that you don't like to do and you can demonstrate how you react 
man, I don't like this assignment, but I'm going to do it and I'm going to finish it. And then I'm going to do what I want and showing her that you can still be frustrated with something that comes up in life, but it doesn't mean that you have to be stubborn and um, push full heartedly the whole way. But you can also learn that, okay, if I get it done, I can then move on to something else. But I think really exploring the idea um, of why she likes it her way, because it could be a lot of control. And so yeah. maybe if the teacher gives her an option, um, you write the structured story right now, or you do um, the next activity now, where it's both structured activities, but your daughter gets to choose which one. So then she's in control of what she picks. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I have is um, indecisiveness. My daughter is extremely indecisive and um, always says no to everything. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do this or, you know, I don't want to, for example, be always skiing. I don't want to go skiing. I hate it. I hate it. And then she goes and she has fun, you know, and then she makes friends and she enjoys it. And then it's always a push to get her to do any kind of activity. She's always totally negative all the time. Um, and it impacts on the other children because they follow her. I don't want to do tennis. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And then it just all of them are saying they don't want to do anything. Um, so, again, we try to separate her. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just it's very draining for parents um, to constantly be convincing a child why it's, it's fun for you to do this and you meet other children and then really dragging her along. And then at the end of the day, she had a great time and she really enjoyed it. And then I said, well, look all the fuss in the morning and you've enjoyed it now so you know how do you feel about coming going again tomorrow yes yes and then she goes but it's just being strong enough as a parent to force her to do something and then when she finally does it she's happy um but you know is that the right approach to that i'm doing or should i change my approach it it really depends um i've seen parents do it that way i've also seen parents do it a different way but i think ultimately it sounds like you're daughter might have some anxiety about doing some new situations and mm -hmm. so I think exploring what the anxiety is and it could be again of control it could be maybe she doesn't know what's going to happen so she doesn't know what's going to be in this new situation so she feels out of control and for her that gives her anxiety and mm -hmm. I think really exploring that with her and like you're doing you're doing it already but before it happens say Remember last time we went skiing, you said you didn't want to, and then you loved it. This is going to be the same thing. Let's just try tennis. Let's see if you like it. And then we can decide. And just really reminding her of the times when um, she did end up doing it and acknowledging her feelings. Um, I wonder if you're feeling really anxious about this new thing. Um, sometimes it's really, really hard to do new things. It can be scary to do new things. Um, but as you notice, these new things bring you so much fun and you love to do them, but really acknowledging her emotion and labeling it, if it's anxiety, if it's fear, if it's um, something of the unknown, just saying, you seem really scared to do this. Um, I'll be right there with you. We'll do it together. Your sisters will be there. Your siblings will be there. Um, your dad will be there and letting her know that you support her even though she's feeling anxious about it. Yeah, that's a good idea because I probably I don't really um, I don't really um, notice her emotions and saying, oh, I understand how you're feeling. I, I don't do that enough, probably. Yeah, I I'd normally miss it and just try to just push my view and get her to just do what I'm telling her to do. But as opposed to um, understanding her feeling about the situation. Yeah, that's right. A good idea. Oh. And it can, it can be absolutely hard because, like you said, you have three other children and to take the time to address the feelings and the emotions of one child can really take away from the routine you're in. Maybe if you're trying to get to a doctor's appointment, it can you might not have the time to do that. And so it's just bearing in mind that when you do have the time taking it to really address the emotions of what's happening. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you very much for that, mm -hmm. Kendall. Of course. I also see that we have Mary. It looks like Mary joined. Um, hi, Mary. Do you have any questions for this webinar today? Hello. Hi. Good morning. Sorry. Hi. I was trying to unmute myself. No problem. Hello. Hi. Good morning. 
Um, yeah, sorry, apologies. I joined a bit late, but um, yes, I do have some questions. Good morning, everyone on call. Good morning. Um, hi, I morning. had um, similar questions to um, the some of the questions that a lady just uh, mentioned earlier. So I've got a daughter who has um, a diagnosis of um, ASD with PDA. Okay. Um, and <laughs> over the years, I mean, uh, to say it's, yeah, it's, it, it can be quite challenging. Like she does have challenging behavior. Um, and I think one thing that sometimes we struggle with is um, always being told you just have to keep trying different strategies. So I okay. feel like with a lot of things, it's trial and error. Okay. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example. So when we do a reward chart, it will have to be something that she really, um, you know, enjoys or something that's of interest to her. Okay. But after after some time uh, using the chart and rewarding her because you've got to reward her for, you know, the, the little things and then build it up. Okay. But what we find that it's, it will work for a little bit and then afterwards she's not, she's then non-compliant and then you have okay. to try and find something else. And I just wondered, is that a common thing with uh, children who have ASD and PDA or is it, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, when you say when you say PDA, are you talking about the demand avoidance or what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, pathological with yeah. demand okay. avoidance, yes. Okay. Um, just wanted to clarify before I move yes, forward. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no worries. Um, so what we find or what I find in my practice is when I come across a child with PDA, they mm. often have a lot of high anxiety. Yes. And, and yeah. okay, so that sounds like it's with you too. Okay. Absolutely. And so and you mentioned that she's non-compliant after the reward chart or the chart you have doesn't work anymore. So it basically Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would it's, say it gets to a point and then it just she just starts to think it's a game. So she will just sometimes she will comply just for the sake of you getting off her back. OK, but in most cases, it's usually a, yeah, a, a non-compliant attitude that you get. OK, and, and that could the, be anything. OK, and the items you're using for her, are they really rewarding for her? Um, yeah, I mean, she's gotten a bit older now. So when we were doing the sticker charts, those were good. Or she was into um, things like uh, she loves watching YouTube a lot. She watches particular things on YouTube all the time. But also she's into um, Play-Doh or slime, okay. making different types of slime. So, yeah, you just end up buying and buying these things because <laughs> that is what she wants. Um, right. But I think the battle is trying to give into what she wants, but also still have some control because I think mm -hmm. she always likes to control things. Right. And that's due to the anxiety. Mm, yeah. I mean, if you think about it in the situation also with um, when another parent was talking, and if you think about it in your normal daily life, if you've ever experienced anxiety, when you have the anxious feelings, your ultimate coping mechanism immediately goes to how can I control the situation to eliminate these feelings? And that's where the PDA comes in because she thinks, okay, if I can do this, then I can lower my anxiety and then do what I want because I feel better. And I think it's absolutely normal. I mean, every child I've worked with, with ASD has, changed what they like on a normal basis it probably changes every week every month there's always something new and it's also something that if you use the same item more than once or if you use it too much the child can actually get um uh, uh, too assimilated to it and they like it too much and then they're like i've had that too much i want something else now so always using um, a, a flip of items that you use. If you know she likes Play-Doh, if you know she likes slime, if you know she likes YouTube, 
um, intertwining them together so that one time she gets YouTube, one time she gets slime, one time she gets Play-Doh, and really making it um, like a roulette kind of basis so that she can still get something that she likes, but it's not necessarily the same thing every time because you can find, I mean, like with you or I, if, if we eat too much chocolate, we then will say, I've had too much chocolate right now. And it's just really knowing that it's the same thing for children. If they play with the same toy too much, it's very common that they want something else. So it's, it's absolutely normal that your child is starting to become non-compliant when these things don't work anymore. It's just finding something new again. And then when you find something new, mixing it in with something else so that you can switch back and forth. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. It does make sense. Um, yeah, I think from even what schools say, they usually say you just have to have um, a mix of different strategies to um, to kind of, you know, manage her a lot of the times. Right. Um, but I, ju I just, it was just the thought, I just wondered, is it something that's common with children with that symptom? Because mm -hmm. she also is quite, impulsive okay. um, so sometimes you don't know is it the impulsivity that you need to kind of tackle so that then everything else settles or is it the anxiety but okay yeah, she definitely carries a lot of anxiety okay yeah I think is is she or is your child at a level where you can communicate with them and discuss yeah. what she's anxious about okay she communicates the only thing is that she 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 struggles to regulate her emotions so if she's overly excited it may come out it may come out to someone else as if she's you know why she behave in this manner or she can get very um you know things like she gets very animated so she'll throw herself around and she's not very aware of you know of how that impacts or looks to other people okay um but also if she's really upset about something it takes her long time for her to she can't necessarily articulate and say i'm upset because earlier on you um said something that i okay like, or you said something about me so when she's in that moment and even for a very long time she can't articulate that so you would just see the behavior so it might be that she lashes out or she right. gets out or right. she throws and destroys things mm -hmm. um and i think the challenge for us and pretty much people that work with her is that sometimes they can't see the triggers i mean sometimes i can see the triggers but that's just because maybe we've kind of learned over the years because she's mm -hmm. now um she's now going to be 11 okay but there for people who don't know her very well they don't necessarily see the triggers okay and sometimes she doesn't articulate the trigger so she might be upset about something but you don't know what the issue is and i think it's just trying to find ways and strategies to to help her cope or to help her absolutely communicate those things absolutely yeah and i'm sure you found mary with her being almost 11 that no one strategy is perfect and no. some strategies might work better in some situations and some might work better in others yeah. and i think that i mean that's ultimately what these webinars are for is to make sure that the parents who attend leave with this toolkit of i know what i can do with my child and i have different options of how i can help them because if we leave you with just one option, if that option doesn't work or only works for a short amount of time, then you guys don't have anything. And so it's, it's knowing that having these multiple strategies really is important. And I think the, the fact that when she is exhibiting these challenging behaviors, she's, it's hard for her to articulate how she feels, that's a good time for you to step in and say, oh, you look like you're mad and you look like you wanted that. And mirroring it and giving her the answer and letting her know that this is how she's feeling because if you can know the trigger, you can then match it with a response. 
And then you can say, next time you feel this way, you can let me know that you were mad and you wanted this. And going through it with her and then taking it out of context, doing a role play where you just have a situation, something like the trigger that happened, and you simulate it and you basically do the situation with her and then go through it with her. What are you feeling right now? What can you tell me? Um, what's going on and really just processing it with her and taking the time to break that situation down into steps when she's feeling calm so she can practice how she can articulate when she's feeling stressed and anxious. Yeah, I think the challenge for us is sometimes we don't necessarily, so she pretty much goes from kind of like, uh, I don't know, from like two to like, you know, 20 or 100 very quickly and sometimes there is no warning sign okay and so when she gets to that heightened state she literally when I, in terms of communication she just shuts down and then just lashes out so right. most of the time the strategies we've kind of adopted is just to leave her and let her calm down get out whatever it is and calm down yeah. but that could be an hour that could be most of the evening that could be you know it could just be half an hour but most of the time it's quite a long time that you just mm -hmm. have to leave her till she is ready to talk right but then when she does speak sometimes it's it's a case that I don't want to talk about it or I don't know okay you know so it's yeah it's, it's trying to unpick what it is mm -hmm. and I think that's a, a real challenge for, for us at the moment okay yeah and I mean I think if you think about it in a normal situation if you or I were to be upset and we think um, okay I don't want to talk about this right now it's very normal for you or I to say that in an adult conversation and so I think recognizing her behavior if it's something that needs to be discussed if for instance she was aggressive or something happened that's something that needs to be discussed or if it was just a normal behavior or um, a normal emotion she experienced and she expresses to you I don't want to talk about it right now I think for her being 11 that's I mean I think that's her also her form of communication and she's doing it very well and putting her down um, by herself to calm down to cool down is really great and I mentioned this also to another parent before it could be 30 minutes to an hour and for a parent that can be overwhelming oh my gosh this is taking so long why is it taking so long but we have to realize that she's feeling something and we need to address what she's feeling and give her the space and time to address it appropriately so if she needs an hour giving her an hour if she says i don't want to talk about it and that's okay then say okay thank you for telling me if there is something where she says i don't know it's then exploring it with her and using the role play scenarios using the strategies that you have to say hmm i know you might not think you know but maybe let's break down the situation again um what happened right before you were feeling this way um did something happen did someone say something to you um, maybe making guesses. Was it because I left the room? Was it because dad went to work? And putting pieces together for her can also really help because it could be that maybe she really doesn't know what's happening. But for you and your partner and for her, it's a process together to discuss what is happening because no one might have the answer right away. But by talking about it and um, exploring the options, you're closer to finding the answer. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, that's, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I think we've been doing some of those things anyway um, already, although sometimes it can be overwhelming, especially mm -hmm. when she does get physical. Right. So a lot of the times we just tend to kind of like, leave her be and that could take a while so sometimes I might go back and just try and see if she's a lot calmer like when things she's quieter and she seems to just it sometimes it's as if she doesn't want to talk about 
whatever it is so she doesn't relive the mo- the the feeling mm-hmm. i don't know if it's something i don't know if that makes any sense it does it does because i mean if you think about it with with you or i if we go through something that's high anxiety or something traumatic we don't want to talk about it and yeah. that's that's also something for you to decide if you think it's something to talk about you can let her know honey you're in a really safe space right now it's just you and me i'm here to help you um we can talk about this really slowly um we'll go at your pace and just making her feel safe and supported okay okay all right i think i just need to relay that to school as well because she's just missing out a lot now that um her school they've they had a trip recently which she was so looking forward to and i know she doesn't cope very well with going away it could mean sleepless nights for weeks because she's so anxious but she also wants to go so she's always between the two um but i think because of her challenge and behavior school always concerned about sort of safety and Mm -hmm. um, security risk so a lot of the times they'll say we don't think it's appropriate for her to go and I feel that she's missing out a lot of the time because of it but also we then get the sort of um you know the aftermaths and the impacts of that because she feels that well I can't do this or I can't do it or feels rejected right and that could go on for a number of days Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think I just communi- wondered what you think we could um, do in, in those sorts of instances. Right. And I think um, definitely communicating with the school is very important. So just letting them know, hey, it's going to take her a little bit longer. Don't necessarily exclude her, but maybe try processing it with her. Maybe try asking her what's going on. Um, because she really does like to be a part of what's happening. She doesn't want to miss out. We're seeing that when she does miss out, she comes home. She's sad for the whole night. Um, It's hard for her to talk about it. It affects her for multiple days. And just saying, we want to help her and we want to help her together and getting on the same board as what's going on at home and what's happening at school and just really keeping that open communication with school and letting them know Um, what you're working on at home, what you think, ask them what they think, and just really it's all exploration and figuring out what's going to help your daughter best. So it's all, it all starts with talking and it's all talking, having the communication, figuring out what you can do. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's been really helpful. Of course. Thank you. And I wanted to say thank you, everyone else, for attending. I know some previous guests have left left because we're a bit over time. But thank you so much for being a part of this webinar. We have more webinars listed on our website for the next couple of months up until July. So definitely take a look. And we look forward to talking with you again at the next one. So thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day.